Socrates used to encounter people who thought they knew more than they actually did. They thought their reasons were stronger than they actually were. One of the best things we can do to improve our own reasons for what we think is to learn a little logic. Now, we use statements to express our reasons. So the first thing we do in learning logic is analyze statements. I'm going to explain to you some basic logical properties of statements, simple statements and compound statements, including conjunctions, disjunctions, and conditionals. Then I'm going to explain some symbols for representing statements. Simple statements are composed of a subject and a predicate. Amy sings, or Amy is singing. Amy is the subject, sings, or singing is the predicate. In another example, Hedwig flies. Hedwig is the subject, flies is the predicate. Owls fly. Owls is the subject. Owls is ambiguous between all owls or some owls. Aristotle built a logical system around the difference between all or some predications. So much for simple statements. Let's review. What are the two parts of a simple statement? If you said subject and predicate, you'd be right. These statements may be about what is the case, what might be the case, what should be the case, in the past, present, or future. Let's now turn to compound statements. The first kind is a conjunction. A conjunction brings together two or more simple statements. Amy sings, Ted dances. Those are simple statements. We could bring them together with and and form a compound statement. Another kind of compound statement is a disjunction brought together with an or. A third is a conditional, if then. If Amy sings, then Ted dances. In logic, we like to represent simple statements or compound statements even, with letters, P, Q, R, S, T. Some like to use A, B, C, but I prefer P, Q, R because P reminds me I'm dealing with an entire proposition, both subject and predicate. Whether a compound statement is true or false depends on whether the component statements are true or false. To illustrate, let's make a table with a column for P, a column for Q, a column for P and Q, a column for P or Q, and a column for either P or Q. P stands for Amy's singing, Q stands for Ted's dancing. If someone were to say, Amy is singing and Ted is dancing, in other words, if they were to assert the conjunction, then what would make that claim true? Well, Amy would have to be singing and Ted would have to be dancing. Then the conjunction would be true. If, however, Amy were not singing or Ted were not dancing, then the conjunction would be false. It would also be false if neither Amy were singing nor Ted were dancing. If someone said, Amy is singing or Ted is dancing, and they both are in fact doing those activities, the claim is true. But if one of them is not doing that activity, the claim is still true. It would take both of them to not be doing those activities for the claim to be false. Either P or Q is a little different because it asserts that only one of the component parts may be true in order for the compound statement to be true. Let's now consider the conditional. If P, then Q. What would make it true? What would make it false? Well, if Amy is singing and Ted is dancing, then the assertion, if P, then Q, seems to be true. On the other hand, if Amy is singing but Ted is not dancing, the claim is false. Most logicians claim that when the first part is false, the claim overall is true, but some logicians have questioned that assumption because the first part doesn't hold, and it's hard to know. Let's look at conditional statements more closely. The standard form is if P then Q. 
This indicates that P is a sufficient condition for Q, while Q is a necessary condition for P. Consider a car. If a car is running, then there's fuel in the tank. The car is running is sufficient evidence that there's fuel in the tank. But if there is not fuel in the tank, we wouldn't expect the car to be running. The fuel in the tank is a necessary condition for the car's running. We can indicate this more clearly by using the phrase only if. If P then Q is logically equivalent to P only if Q, which brings out more clearly that Q is a necessary condition for P. If P is both sufficient and necessary for Q, then we use the biconditional and say P if and only if Q. P and Q are not precisely the names of the parts of compound statements. These parts have more formal names. In a conjunction, the parts are called conjuncts. In a disjunction, the parts are called disjuncts. P and Q represent statements that go into those compound statements as conjuncts or disjuncts. In a conditional, the part that goes after the if or before the only if is called the antecedent. The part that goes after the then or after the only if is called the consequent. The antecedent is a sufficient condition for the consequent. For example, if I say, if Amy sings, then Ted dances, Amy sings is the antecedent. Ted dances is the consequent. The consequent is a necessary condition for the antecedent. If I say, Amy sings only if Ted dances, Ted dances is the consequent, and it's a necessary condition for the antecedent, Amy sings, as indicated by the phrase, only if. That concludes our discussion of conjunctions, disjunctions, and conditionals. It's now time for a question. Why must the antecedent of a conditional be false when the consequent is false? If you said, because the consequent is a necessary condition for the antecedent, you'd be right. In order to make the writing of compound statements easier, we use the following symbols. For the conjunction, we use a dot or a wedge. For an inclusive disjunction, we use a V. For an exclusive disjunction, that is an either-or disjunction, we use a V with a bar beneath it. For the conditional, we use a horseshoe on its side or an arrow to indicate if-then. And for the biconditional, we use a triple bar or an arrow pointing both directions. There's one more symbol we need to learn, and that is the one for negation. If I want to say it's not the case that something is so, we use one of these two marks. So if I want to say it is not the case that Amy sings, I represent Amy sings with P, and I negate it with one of the marks indicated. Some English expressions that we use to indicate logical connections between statements are and, but, and however for conjunctions. For disjunctions we use or or unless. For the antecedent of a conditional we'll see if or when or whenever among other phrases. And for the consequent of a conditional we'll see then or so or only if or provided that or a number of other phrases. That concludes our discussion of symbols. Now a question. What are several ways of expressing a conditional in English? Here are some examples. If the car runs, it has fuel. The car runs only if it has fuel. The car runs so it has fuel. Those three are logically equivalent. Now that we understand simple statements and compound statements and their logical properties, in the next part we'll put them together to form valid arguments.